This morning we are beginning a new series, a series on the book of Haggai, minor prophet, uh, minor uh, only in length, not in what he has to say uh, to the people of God. Uh, the book of Haggai, if you're using the, the Pew Bible, is found, found on page uh, 791. Uh, those of you using your own Bibles, uh, go to the New Testament and then go three books backwards, and you'll see Malachi, Zechariah, and Haggai. It's the third uh, book uh, from the end. And as you'll see, it's a short book of uh, two chapters, and we'll spend uh, a number of months in this book. It may be short, but it's a sword that goes in quickly and deeply. And so let's uh, begin by looking at Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Uh, Listen to the holy and inerrant word of God. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Father, I pray as we look at this passage that you would give us insight, indeed heavenly insight, In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In order to properly understand the passage before us, we need to put it in its historical context. Remember that Judah and its capital, Jerusalem, had been conquered by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Babylonians came through Jerusalem uh, decimated uh, the city, and then uh, many of the Jews were taken into exile at that time, taken to Babylon. Babylon itself uh, soon fell to the Persians in 539 B.C. The Persian king Cyrus uh, destroyed uh, the Babylonians, and then he authorized at that time in 539 B.C., he authorized that any exiled Jew could return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, the very end of the book, the very end of the historical sections of the Old Testament, we read this. 2 Chronicles 36, beginning at verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, That the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. He also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. The very next year, in 538 B.C., some 50,000 Jews left Babylon to return to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the temple. The returners began constructing the temple In 536 B.C., two years after they left Babylon to come back, they begin building the temple, and that building is described in the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 3 tells us of the beginning of that building. And according to Ezra chapter 3, verse 8, 
The two leaders of the construction project are Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, uh, the son of Jehozadak. Both of those figures are mentioned in verse 1 of Haggai, chapter 1. And we see there that there is a great beginning to the building project. In Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, we read about that. They've all come back. 50,000 have come back from exile in Babylon. They've come to Jerusalem, and they're rebuilding the temple. And what do we read? And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So, an exciting time in 536 B.C., when the 50,000 people come back to the land of Israel, come back to Jerusalem, and they lay the foundation for the rebuilding of the temple. What a wonderful, joyous occasion. Now we go to the prophet Haggai, who arrives on the scene. Look at verse 1 of chapter 1. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. We read at the outset, verse 1, that Haggai prophesied in the second year of Darius, the king. Darius is the king of Persia, who is a later king from Cyrus, who told uh, the Jews that they can come back. Darius ruled from 522 to 486 B.C. And so what we see is Haggai is prophesying in the second year of Darius, that is, 520 B.C. Now, I know all the dates can get confusing, but I'm driving at something very important here. Haggai is prophesying in 520 B.C. This is 18 years after the Jews had returned from Babylon and 16 years after they had started building the temple. After they had that wonderful celebration of laying the foundation of the temple, now we're 16 years later in the life of the Jews in Jerusalem. Now, note to whom Haggai's prophecy is directed. To Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Remember that it was these two men uh, who, 16 years earlier, had been put in charge of the construction of the temple. So in 538, 50,000 returned to Jerusalem. 536, they start building the temple under these two men, Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua. Now, let's go to verse 2. We see the opening words of Haggai to these two leaders. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Note first, the Haggai says, thus says the Lord of hosts. What Haggai prophesies is what God says. What God says is what Haggai prophesies. These are the very words of God coming from the prophet, uh, from God through the prophet to the people. The people had come back from exile 18 years earlier for the very purpose of building the temple. But now the people are saying... The time's not right. The time has not yet come to finish the building. This is 16 years later. Why is the time not right? Why, has, uh, why, why have they not been building the temple? They're paralyzed. They're in stasis. Why is that the case? It is so many years later. Why are they paralyzed? 
I suppose uh, we, if, if we were there, we, we could have talked to them, and I'm, I'm sure some of them have said, well, you know, we're under severe persecution. We are under severe persecution. In fact, Ezra chapter 4 talks about that persecution. Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Listen to this. Indeed, it's true. They are under persecution from the people of the land. Ezra 4. Now, when the adversaries of Judah heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, <coughs> who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building the house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, had commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed them. Okay, so here they are. They've come back in 538, but they've been under great persecution from the non-Jews who are in the land. Uh, and certainly the people of God uh, uh, could, have been, uh, could have used that for justification to delay the building of the temple. That's why we're not building it. We're under persecution from the people of the land. Perhaps they could have understood that their adversity uh, was because uh, uh, ultimately it was from God. God's brought this adversity upon us, so he doesn't want us to build the temple. If he wanted us to build the temple, he would have made our way easy. But we have all this persecution. It must be God's will that we don't build the temple. Perhaps they were simply looking for a more convenient time. It's difficult to know all the ins and outs, isn't it? All the reasons that they perhaps could have used to justify the fact that they've been back for 16 years. The foundation of the temple has been laid, but now they're not doing any building whatsoever. They come up with all sorts of reasons that they didn't do that. Well, note that Haggai is not going to allow them to get away with that. Haggai, verses 3 through 4, underscores the primary reason they're not building the temple. Look what it says. Verses 3 and 4, Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin. The reason the Jews stopped building the temple that is given by the prophet is much more sinister. It's much more devious than we would have thought. They wanted to use their time and money to build their own houses. They are living in, as the verse says, paneled houses. That is, well-made houses, fancy houses, luxurious homes. The people are full of care and concern to enrich their own houses while nothing is being done on God's house, on his temple. They're building their own mansions. They are pleasing themselves first. They are serving themselves first. Or as Matthew Henry commented, they are preferring conveniences and ornaments of temporal life before the absolute necessities of the spiritual life. It's also interesting that the term there, paneled, that's used in, in verse 4, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? That's a very rare word in Hebrew. It's used here, and then it's used in 1 Kings of the construction of the temple. God's temple, God's house is paneled. 1 Kings chapter 6. Verse 9, it says, Solomon built the house of God. He built its ceilings with beams and paneling of cedar. The whole temple that Solomon, that glorious temple that Solomon put up, 
It was paneled inside with this cedar planking. The ornate house, the house of splendor, is what is at the forefront of the Jewish minds and hearts. But it's their own houses of splendor. They have become indifferent to the temple. They are spiritually asleep. They are concerned about their own things. Their driving forth force is their own wealth, is their own ornate houses. We read in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks about this in a different way. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22, we read the following. And behold, a man came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to Jesus, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. We understand that parable, don't we? We understand what's going on here with the people in Jerusalem. Wealth and possessions and things are quite alluring to us. And when they become a central focus of our lives, they can help to bankrupt us spiritually. We, like the Israelites, can easily become so busy building our mansions here on earth that, that, that we grow cold to the things of Christ. We enter spiritual paralysis because we love things more than we love Jesus. Do we, like the Israelites, do we love and and treasure the things of the world more than we love and treasure Christ? I really think that we are not not fully aware, aware of how dangerous the love of the world can be. How alluring it is and how it, it sets us into spiritual paralysis. John Newton wrote the following to Reverend William Rose, who had just taken a pastorate in a wealthy area of London. And Newton said this to the young pastor. Quote, I would as soon congratulate a man upon seeing a millstone tied about his neck to sink him in the depths of the sea as upon his obtaining what is called a good living except I thought him determined to spend and be spent in the cause of the gospel. So what is Israel to do? What are they to do in Haggai's day? Look at verse 5. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. The Lord, again, speaking through the prophet, and he says, consider your ways. It's unfortunate that the translations do not ex- include an exclamation point at the end of this sentence because the verb is an imperative. Consider your ways. Look at yourself. Look at your heart. 
And the passage literally says, listen to the uh, direct translation from the Hebrew. Set your heart upon your ways, exclamation point. Set your heart upon your ways. And we understand, to the Hebrew, uh, the heart is not just the seat of emotion. That's kind of what it is in the West. We, we say, well, our mind's up here and our heart's down here. Heart is how we feel and emotion. But that's not true for the Hebrew. It's not just the seat of the emotion. The, the heart is the very uh, core of the person. It's the mind and the heart and the will and the desires and the thoughts and everything about us is in the heart. And Haggai says to these people, set your heart upon your ways. Israel is being called to reflect upon who they are, what their priorities are. They are to examine their own hearts and their own ways. Are they living the way a believer ought to live? Are they living the way of a person who belongs to Christ Jesus? This is a hard-hitting statement by the prophet to each one of us who belong to Christ Jesus. All of us here this morning ought to consider our ways, gauge our own hearts, have a period of self-examination concerning our condition in this world, our state in this world. And we need to be honest, and we need to be inquisitive about our walk as Christians. Who are we primarily pleasing in this life? Is it Christ or is it ourselves? We need to know our own hearts. And perhaps even a harder question is to ask ourselves, are we locked in spiritual paralysis? Are we not growing in Christ? Are we not growing in the truths of the Scriptures? And perhaps, like the Israelites, it's because our hearts are focused on the wrong things. Our hearts are focused upon ourselves and upon pleasing ourselves. We need to be like the psalmist. The psalmist in 119.59 says, When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. Or as Jeremiah says in the book of Lamentations, Let us test and examine our ways and let us return to the Lord. Now, in verse 6, a quite difficult passage. Let me read this. God says, you have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. And in this verse, God is asking the Israelites there, you have put yourself first. How's it going? You've put yourself first. What's it gotten you? How are you faring in life by being self-serving and selfish and self-absorbed? How's that working out for you? Well, Haggai here employs five pictures to express one basic idea. The hardship that befalls people who have not included the Lord in their plans and who are preoccupied with their own interests. The futility of selfish effort. Now again, Haggai speaking to the people of God. He's not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to the people of God. And here. 
They have had great expectations regarding their own interests. They have so much. But the reality is that their yield is small. What disappointment to serve yourself and not be satisfied. What disappointment to serve yourself and not be satisfied. And that actually is another way that this verse can be read. It may bear the idea of the people never having enough. No matter how much one eats, no matter how much one drinks, there's never enough. To be self-serving never has an end. It never has a completion. It never satisfies. It never quiets the heart. And so, what is Israel to do? Consider your ways. Gauge your heart. Upon what do you place your heart? This is a question not just for Israel and Jerusalem at this time. The Holy Spirit has preserved this word for us. Each one of us here this morning needs to ask these very questions of ourselves. Who is it that I serve? Who is it that I serve? Amen and amen. Please pray with me. Most Heavenly Father, we proclaim and claim Christ that He is our Savior. But we so easily drift. We so easily lose our way. And we serve ourselves. So, Lord, may you set it upon our hearts that we do consider our ways. And not just simply in some thought category. But may this come out in the way that we live. That we would serve you in all that we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.